quiver of type A2, okay, with this orientation. Well, you can choose any other orientation as well. Okay, so this is um, um, an example to Gabriel's theorem. And the aim of this talk is to associate to this data three objects. The first thing is the Ausländer right and quiver, which is, well, I want to make it as combinatorial as possible. And then the other two are geometric objects. Well, the first one is Lustig's quiver variety, and the second one is Nakajima's quiver variety. And my talk is like describing the crystal structures on these geometric objects combinatorially by using the Ausländer right and quiver. So this is basically what the aim of the talk is. So let me uh, tell you what the Ausländer right and quiver is. So, well, it's again a quiver. So you have again vertices and arrows between these vertices. But now the vertices are, um, are given by the isoclasses of indecomposable representations. So these are the vertices. So you have one vertex for each isoclass of indecomposable representation. So due to Gabriel, um, the indecomposable representations are given by positive roots. So the Ausländer Ryden quiver has as many vertices as the number of positive roots. But I want to think of them as indecomposable representation of the quiver to explain you what the arrows are. Is there a question? Okay, so let me explain you what the arrows are. So you draw an arrow from an indecomposable representation M to an indecomposable representation N, if and only if, by definition, there exists a morphism. So first of all, there should be a morphism from M to N, and this morphism should be irreducible. So what does irreducible mean? It's in the usual sense of algebra, it's a non-unit. So non-unit means, in this case, a non-isomorphism, which cannot be written as a composition of non-isomorphisms. Okay, so this is what an irreducible morphism is. And this is also the ausländer and quiver. Well, now if you want to calculate the ausländer Ryden quiver, so this is just uh, the definition, you have to check whether there are irreducible morphisms. But there is a beautiful construction, which again goes back to Gabriel. And now this, I want to explain how one can construct from a given quiver Q, the Ausländer Ryden quiver, gamma Q. Okay, so this is now uh, what comes next. So in the first step, so it has three steps. In the first step, this is very easy. You just reverse all arrows in Q. So if you have an arrow, just take the opposite arrow. So this is step one, it's very easy. In step two, you take an infinite quiver, and this infinite qu quiver I want to denote by Z Q star. So what is Z Q star? So the vertices are given by Z cross I. So the vertices are of the form R comma I, where R is an integer and I is in this indexing set of the quiver. Okay, so this is an infinite quiver, and I have to explain you what the arrows are. And the arrows are you for each original arrow. So this is an arrow in Q1, okay? So this is an original arrow of your quiver. You take two additional arrows, okay? So two additional arrows for each original arrow. And the first one, okay, let, let us look first at the second one where R is fixed. The second one just says, when you have an arrow from I to J, then you draw an arrow from J to I. So it basically means that you have Q star sitting at each copy of Z, okay? And the second one is you have some connecting arrows, okay? From R to R plus one, but now you keep the original arrow, okay? If you have an arrow from I to J, then you draw an arrow again from I to J, but it's connecting R and R plus one. Let's look at an example. So I'm taking this quiver of type A3. Um, to make this construction work, so I'm taking this uh, stupid enumeration, uh, not one to three, I have to put the one in the middle and the two and three at the outer part. And the reason is to make this construction 
work, one has to choose uh, an admissible uh, numbering of the labels. And that is, um, you have to start at, as, at a sink. Well, so this is a sink. Every arrow draws in that direction. So this is why you put a one over here. Okay, so let's, let's go step one and step two. We can just, I think, combine these two steps and just write down what this quiver here is. So let me explain what that is. So in the zero copy, so this is zero, 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 um, I told you that you have Q star sitting here. Okay, so when you keep the first entry, then you have a Q star. So now if you look into this copy, then you see almost the original quiver but you don't have an arrow from three to one anymore. You have an arrow from one to three and you have an arrow from one to two. So this is just Q star. And then, uh, okay, this is now done. And now the second type of, uh, of arrows, they told, you, they told you, you keep the original quiver. So three goes to one and two goes to one, but you have the connecting arrows. So for minus one to zero and minus one to zero. So these are the purple uh, arrows over there. And then you're getting this infinite quiver. And now Gabriel tells us, so you can cut out a certain sub quiver of this quiver to get the Ausländer writing quiver. And how you do this, this will be step three. And for that, you need the Nakayama permutation. So what is the Nakayama permutation? The Nakayama permutation gives you a map between certain indecomposable projective modules and indecomposable injective modules. If you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. We can explicitly write down the formula for type A there's also an explicit formula for type D and for type E, which I don't know by heart, but this is the formula for type A. So Ri is mapped to R plus I minus one and N plus one minus I. Okay, so we're almost there. Um, one thing is missing, namely what is SQ. So I define SQ to be the unique slice containing zero one and which is isomorphic to Q. So let's go to this example. So I'm taking the unique slice which contains zero one. It's exactly this. Well, you can look at this part, but this is not isomorphic to Q. It was isomorphic to Q star. But if you look at this part, then it has zero one and it, as a graph, it's isomorphic to Q. So this part will be SQ. Uh, so now we... Sorry, uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. so, so you always begin with the sink, right? Yeah, I always begin with a sink, and then I reverse the arrows at that sink, and then the next number must be again a sink. Okay. Okay, so... Now, this is now how uh, um, the Ausländer Reiten quiver is obtained. It's the full subquiver of this infinite quiver formed by the vertices between SQ and new of SQ. Let's look at it. Here we are. So this was SQ. This was my infinite quiver. And now, uh, Gabriel tells us we look at SQ and new of SQ. Okay, so what is new of SQ? Well, new has a very explicit formula. So we just have to calculate what is new of minus one comma three, what is new of zero comma one, and what is new of minus one comma two. So let's look, for example, at minus one comma three. So let's plug in minus one comma three here. So it is minus one plus three minus one. So it's a one. We start with the quiver of type A3. So this is N plus one is four. Minus three is again one. So the image is one, one. So minus one, three goes to one, one. Now, if you repeat that for the others, you will see that zero, one goes to zero, three and minus one 
2 goes to 0, 2. And if you re read this sentence again, it's the full subwoofer formed by the vertices between SQ and the image. It's this. Well, then we are getting exactly this part here. And this is the Auslander right quiver. And if we count the vertices, we are counting six. And luckily, uh, the Lie algebra of type A3 has uh, six positive roots. Okay, so this is the Auslander right quiver. And I want to use the combinatorics of this quiver later to describe the crystal structure on the geometric part. So I want to make a little break now. I want to come back to this picture at the end of my talk. And now I want to talk a little bit about uh, quiver varieties. Okay, so I forgot to say one more thing. Sorry, uh, is it clear from this picture which simple is uh, which vertex? Uh, this is a very good question. It's not very clear, but you can calculate it. And I can tell you how. So first of all, um, it's like, um, how to say? So, um, okay, maybe, maybe let me tell you what the Ausländer Ryden translation is first, and then I will like, come back to this. Okay. okay. So, the Ausländer Ryden translation, so there's a few more arrows here. So, you see these dotted arrows. Okay. So, these dotted arrows are the Ausländer Ryden translations, and they give you a bijection between the indecomposable non -projection, projectives and the indecomposable non-injectives. And the map is very easy. It maps PQ to P minus 1Q. So it shifts just to the left. This is what the Ausländer right in translation is. Okay, so now I want to come back to your question. So um, you can, well, you can determine what the uh, projective modules are. So the projective modules are just given by uh, the following. So you take the pass algebra. So let me denote by A the pass algebra of the quiver. Okay. And then you, uh, you, you know what the projectives are. The indecomposable projectives are just, you have three, P of one, P of two, and P of three. Well, P of one is just A times E1. So these are all uh, paths which end at vertex one. And all P2 is just all, uh, it's A times E2, and P3 is A times E3. So it's all uh, vertices, which uh, all paths which end at uh, E2, and all uh, vert uh, paths which end at vertex E3. So these you can calculate. Well, the dimension vectors of them, and the dimension vectors correspond to the roots. Okay? So, Maybe we, we just do it here at one, one position. Okay, maybe I have to go back to the, uh, to the quiver. Okay, so let me try to calculate what is P of one. Okay, so P of one is just A times E1. So you look at the quiver. Okay, so now you have to uh, take the original enumeration. Okay. So you look at the quiver uh, and you want to take all paths which, so in the first, okay, so let me draw the quiver again. So you, 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 you now um, take all paths which end at uh, E1 and start at E1. So then you have only one path over here. So you have to put a C here. And you have to take now to, 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 uh, to determine the dimension of the vector space which you're attaching here you have to count the paths um, which end at E1 and start at uh, E2, but there is no pass which starts here and ends here. So here you have to put the trivial one. And um, on the other side uh, here for the last vertex, okay, let me draw the last vertex, you have to count all paths which start at three and end at one. So there's also no. So you see this corresponds to alpha one. So now you can do that only for the non, uh, pro, uh, for the projectives, okay? So now to get the other vertices, now let's go back to, to, to the Ausländer right and quiver. So you know that for the projectives, for these. So how do you get this one? So for that, that's why I wanted to introduce the Ausländer right and quiver first. You can um, do the following. So, uh, 
the aus okay so now okay so assume you have a representation sorry, m here and you want to know what this representation uh, m prime is so what you basically have to know or the the root corresponding to that representation so you have to determine tau inverse m which is m prime but tau inverse m there is a rule how you can calculate it namely um, can i ask a question sorry yeah sure uh, when you say this um, um, non project non uh, indecomposable non projectives and non injectives yeah uh, which for which quiver uh, for the original quiver q okay all this is super, okay okay thank you so it's, we are, it's yeah. for the thank original you original quiver yeah. Yeah. thank you yeah you're welcome okay and and then to to finish this question then you can um say that the dimension of this m prime well it's basically the dimension vector okay so so uh, okay say uh Okay, say this corresponds to the root alpha and this corresponds to the root beta, then you know that beta is obtained from alpha by certain simple reflections, si1 up to sik, where i1 up to ak is some admissible enumeration of my quiver. Namely, again, i1 is a sink, i2 is a sink if you reverse all arrows at i1, and so on. And this you can only do if these two are connected by uh, the Austin and Wright uh, transformation. So you can do that, but you have to work a bit. So it's an algorithm, basically, how you can determine it. Okay. okay so we will, we will later see this quiver again, and then I will tell you which points correspond to the roots. But just as a graph, it's this. So you get all the vertices uh, starting with the projectives and then using the Auslander rate and translation. Uh, yeah, you will. You, yeah, you, well, uh, in this case, you're, you're getting it. In the other case, one has to, uh, well, it's in the slice, in the slice, okay, you can do that and then you can translate from slice to slice. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Thanks. Okay. So um, now let's go to the geometric part, to the quiver varieties. So as I said, I want to minimize that, but at least I have to tell you the, uh, the ideas. Okay, so um, to our Lie algebra G, okay, one can associate uh, a certain Hopf algebra, the quantum group associated to G. And it's a very well-known thing that the finite dimensional irreducible representations are parameterized by dominant integral weights. Okay, so for each dominant integral weight, you can associate a representation, which I want to call V of lambda. Okay? And uh, uh, P plus is basically, well, it's, uh, uh, it's a lattice. So you can just uh, think of it as uh, Z power uh, plus power the rank of the Lie algebra G. Okay? So this is uh, uh, what a dominant integral weight is. Okay, so um, now you can associate, so Kashiwara associated to this representation something which he called crystal basis. Okay, so you can associate to UQ and minus, so you can think of it as the Verma module, and to the representation V of lambda, it's crystal basis, V infinity and V lambda respectively. Okay. So I've seen there were already a few talks on crystal theory in this algebraic combinatorial seminar. But if you don't know what a crystal is, you can just think of it as a certain set. Okay, so it's nothing but a set equipped with certain maps. So you have a weight map, you have the Kashiwara operators, EI tilde, FI tilde, and you have epsilon i and phi i, and of course you have certain properties. For example, you want EI tilde and FI tilde to be inverse to each other whenever it's defined. Okay, so this is um, what uh, you can think of what a crystal is and they have very nice uh, uh, 
properties, namely they encode more or less the structure of representations. For example, if you want to calculate the character of a representation or the dimension of a representation, then you can, or tensor product decompositions, you can read it off uh, in the crystal. Yeah? For example, the dimension is the number of elements in the crystal. Okay, so this is um, a rather old story and understanding these two crystals, B infinity and B lambda, this has really lots of contributors. So it would never end if I start to count uh, the contributors to this theory, but at least I think I should say uh, Kashiwara, uh, uh, Schilling, Okado, Shimozono, uh, who worked uh, on realizations of these crystals. Well, I think the best known is the set of semi-standard Young tableau. Well, it's a certain array of boxes and you fill these boxes with numbers and semi-standard means um, it's uh, weakly increasing along the rows and strictly increasing along the columns. Okay, so this gives you one realization of B lambda, oh, sorry, uh, of uh, B lambda. And then you also have little mon pass, which is, uh, has the nice property that uh, it works for any symmetrizable Katz-Modi. And I think you can even drop symmetrizable. Um, and you have polyhedral polytop realizations of that. And uh, my focus of my talk is more on the algebraic geometric part, which is the quiver variety realization. And this goes back to uh, Kashiwara and Saito. If you work with B infinity, so with the uh, crystal B infinity, and just Saito in 2002, if you work with B lambda. That's why you have two geometric things. One is the Lustig quiver variety, if you want to realize B infinity. And the other is the Nakajima quiver variety, if you want to realize B lambda. Okay, so this is a, a little bit um, um, the, about the geometric realization. And now I want to explain a little bit about these uh, 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 geometric models, where they come from and what they have to do with quivers. Okay, so what is this V? So this V is just a representation, uh, is just a dimension vector. So you take a collection of, uh, for each vertex, you choose a non-negative uh, integer. Okay, so this is what the V is. And then I want to introduce wrap V of Q. So rep V of Q is just, you choose all representations. So remember that the representation of a quiver is just you attach to each vertex a vector space. So this vector space can have a dimension. And the dimension, you're, you're, so with this notation, you're fixing the dimension of the vector space. Okay, so you're telling uh, to the vertex one, you attach a, a vector space of dimension V1 to, uh, to it. Vertex two, you attach a, um, a vector space of dimension V2. So the only freedom you have is to choose the linear maps. So what that actually is, it's just an affine space, namely it's the direct sum of home spaces between CVI and CVJ for all uh, arrows between I and J. Okay, so this tells you you have to put these vector spaces, but you can choose your uh, homomorphism in between. Okay, so, and then there is, this is an affine uh, variety, and there is a reductive group acting on this affine variety, namely the product of GLVIs via base change. And this base change is very easy. So instead of going directly from CVI to CVJ, you first apply GI inverse, and then you go to F via F, and then you apply GJ. This is the action. Okay, so whenever you have an affine space and a reductive group acting on it nicely, um, then you can uh, do many, many things. And one thing is you can construct the moment map. So the moment map in this setting is very explicit. So I'm not going to tell what the moment map in general is. I will just write down explicitly what that is. And for this, I need um, Q1 union Q1 bar. So what is Q1? Again, Q1 was the set of arrows of your original quiver Q. And Q1 bar is just for each arrow, you take the opposite arrow with the opposite direction. Okay? So it's like, you, it's sometimes called the double quiver. 
So for each uh, arrow, you put another arrow to the other direction. And then the moment map is a map which goes from the cotangent bundle of this affine space. Well, the cotangent bundle of this space, uh, well, it's, it's just uh, this plus the dual of the space, because the cotangent bundle of any vector space is just the vector space plus its dual. And then you go to the direct sum of the Lie algebra of uh, this reductive group. And the map is given by the following rule. So you take an homomorphism FH for each H and H, and you map it to this sum. Okay, so what does that mean? So you take an arrow which, which, um, which ends at I. So if this arrow ends at I, then H bar is an arrow which starts at I. So you go, uh, so this one, okay, so this goes from VI, so this FH goes from uh, VI to something, and then you come back with FH to VI. So it's an endomorphism of VI. Okay, so now I have to tell you what this epsilon of H is. This is very easy. It's one or minus one, and it's one if you are in Q1, and it's minus one if you are in Q1 bar. So this is the moment map, and Lustig's quiver variety is just the zero fiber of this map. So a typical element in the Lustig quiver variety is just a collection of uh, uh, linear uh, maps. Um, which satisfy these um, so-called uh, pre-projective relations, okay? Because the co-variety is related to the pre-projective algebra, the representations of it. Okay, so this is um, Lustig's square variety. And what is now the theorem of Kashivara and Saito? The theorem of Kashivara and Saito from 97 states uh, as follows. So there exists a crystal structure on the set of irreducible components, so every variety decomposes into irreducible components, and this crystal, so there is a crystal structure on it, you can define EI tilde, FI tilde, and so on, this is isomorphic to B infinity. Okay? Of course, I haven't told you how these actions look like, but they are uh, not explicitly described. It's rather, uh, they construct certain bijective maps and then they say one irreducible component is mapped to another, but they cannot say what that actually is. Okay, so one remark. Um, what are, so we have to go, we have to find now the connection to, to back to, to, to quivers and to, to, to Ausländer right and quivers. Oh, so the, sorry, uh, may I ask one more question? Yes, yeah, sure. So, so is this crystal structure completely determined by just the algebraic uh, variety, uh, by the variety, or there's some external information coming to it? Is it um, purely geometric? It's purely geometric. It's purely geometric. I think uh, what they do is the following. Let me try to put it over here. Um, what they do is... Um, Okay, uh, how can I do that without? Uh... Okay, but just to answer your question, it's geometric. They construct, a, well, they have, they construct certain subsets, okay? So they take this quiver variety here and they construct certain subsets which they, which they call I comma C. And then um, they construct something else, which they, uh, okay, maybe I should take here another V, namely uh, C times the unit vector EI i comma zero, and then they take some object here and they define maps, projection maps, p1 and p2, and then they show um, that p2 um, is a principal G bundle, and they show that p1 is a smooth map with connected fibers. And then a result of some standard result of algebraic geometry induces a bijection between the irreducible components here and the irreducible components there. And then they say, my Kashivara operator is just take one and map it to, under this bijection to this. Something like this. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, with this remark, 
I want to say uh, the irreducible components are the closures of co-normal bundles to GV orbits here. So why is that important? So this is a representation, okay? And two representations of your quiver, they are isomorphic if and only if they are in the same orbit, GV orbit. So it means that GV orbits here, they give you isoclasses. So with other words, you can index the irreducible components by isoclasses of your original quiver. So this is the connection from here to here, okay? Well, you don't know what that is, but you can at least index them by isomorphism classes of your original quiver. Okay, so now uh, we have to uh, see what the geometric model for B lambda is. This is uh, Nakajima's quiver varieties. And then I will go back to the Ausländer Wright quiver. And first I want to state my goals. So we fix now a dominant integral weight and I define WI to be... Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. I, can I ask a question? Of course. Of course. Uh, so when you take this irreducible... Uh, it's a question about your notation. So uh -huh. irreducible components of uh, gamma, lambda V that you've written. Mm -hmm. So that V varies uh, overall, that V is the dimension vector? Exactly, it varies over all dimension vectors. So this is over all dimensions? Over okay. all dimensions, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. And this is the, the, the critical part that it does not work for B lambda because you, in this Lustig quiver, I think you have too many irreducible components. You have to, well, you have basically to go to some other set, which mm -hmm. I want to do now for the Nakajima quiver setting. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so how do you define this uh, Nakajima thing? Um, first of all, we take Lustig variety and we, we attach an affine space to it. So what is the underlying quiver explaining the space? Okay, as I said in the, um, in the well, to, to get this one, you just take the, your original quiver, which is just one, two, three, so A3, and you, for each arrow, you draw an opposite arrow. So this is basically encoding Lustig's variety. And now you attach an affine uh, linear map from each CVI to another vector space, CVI. So you have to uh, draw another node, okay, here, which I denote by one prime, two prime, three prime. And then this part is just T1, T2, T3. So you attach a linear map for each I. Okay, then you have, again, you have an action of the same group on this, and you define it via this rule. Okay, so you act on your first component as you did before. And now the second one is, instead of going directly with T1, you first act with G1 inverse, and then you go. So this is an action of that, <clears throat> on that space. Okay, um, then you can define a certain subset, which I denote by stable points. This goes back to Mumford, Mumford stability. And this subset, uh, it's an open non-singular subset, and you take all pairs um, f comma t with this uh, intersection uh, property. <clears throat> so what does this intersection property mean? Um, so let's look at uh, this example over here. So let's look at vertex uh, two. <clears throat> so this condition means you have no um, nothing in the intersection of all kernels which go out of the index i. So let's go, let's look at index two. So you have an arrow going here, you have an arrow going here, and you have an arrow going down. So there is nothing in, so if you have something in the kernel of these three maps, it should better be zero. So this is what a stable point is. And this action uh, induces an action on the stable points. And then we are there, namely the Nakajima quiver variety is just the orbit space of this action. And this is uh, really uh, 
a simplification because uh, here we heavily use that we have a quiver of type ADE. So usually you have to take the Mumford stability with respect to some uh, character and then you will get the proj of the semi-invariant ring but in this ADE case it completely reduces just to uh, just to, to, to the orbit space. You just take orbits. And then the theorem of Saito uh, says that <clears throat> there exists a crystal structure, again, on the irreducible components, isomorphic to B lambda. Again, this is a union over all dimension vectors, but the irreducible components, they may, there are probably no irreducible components. And uh, this will become uh, clear now. Um, um, okay, so what you do, um, <clears throat> okay, let me do the remark first, okay. So uh, the irreducible components here are given again, so you can index them again by ISO classes, but you only take this uh, YM lambda if it's not empty. So I haven't told you now what YM lambda is. So what is YM lambda? So how can you construct uh, an irreducible component of the Nakajima quiver variety using irreducible components of Lustig variety? So let's go back and let's see it for a second. Assume you know what uh, an irreducible component of this variety is. So then an irreducible component of that variety is just take the irreducible component here and attach this space to it. Okay, so we, we already have a notation. So uh, XM was the uh, irreducible component here. So the irreducible component for that is just XM cross this. So now it's important that you have an open subset because the irreducible components of open subsets are just the intersections, the non-trivial intersections. Okay, so that's why YM lambda is defined in this way. So you take the uh, irreducible component for Lustig, you attach this affine space, and you take the intersection. And of course, that is an irreducible component if it's not empty. But it's not easy to decide when it's not empty. At least on the representation, it's not easy. Okay, so uh, what we have is that B lambda uh, has a geometric realization, and you have all xm such that ym lambda is not empty. Okay, so you take all irreducible components which are not empty. So now, what are my goals? So my goals, the first goal is, can I combinatorially, just with pure combinatorics, no algebraic geometry, find a condition on this m such that the corresponding irreducible component is not empty? My second goal, assume Fi tilde xm, well, you know there is a crystal structure on the irreducible components. So you know Fi tilde xm is another irreducible component and every irreducible component corresponds to a representation. So this is equal to xm prime. Now the second question is, is there a combinatorial rule describing m prime? So what is m prime? And the third one, of course, the same for B lambda. And the third one is, can you lift the geometric crystal structure? Now I want to think the other way. So uh, you have something geometric, you want to calculate it, you translate it into combinatorics. Now I want to think the other way. Um, I want to lift uh, the geometric structure to an affine crystal, which is isomorphic to the krill of rich taking crystal. And for that, you know combinatorial models, how to calculate it, but you don't know geometric models. At least I don't know if there exist geometric models for uh, KI crystals. Okay, and um, we want, we solve this, so this is uh, my, uh, the main theorem, as we solve one to three using Reinicke's functions Fi check and Fi. And these functions are certain functions on the Ausländer Wright and Quiver, which I'm uh, going to explain. But let me maybe first explain the main theorem and then uh, uh, explain the ingredients. So there's one assumption I need to do. 
I take uh, my uh, quiver to be co-special. So what does co-special mean? Now let's go back to the very beginning of my talk where I choose uh, a quiver of type ADE with an orientation. So this orientation may have a sink and I want this sink to co correspond to, to a minuscule weight. So in type AN, we have no restriction because every um, node is minuscule. In type D, we have only omega one, omega n minus one and omega n. So you're only allowed to choose an orientation where one of these three nodes is minuscule. So this is the restriction uh, uh, where one of these nodes is one, n minus one or n. So this is the restriction on the theorem. And the, uh, the first result is um, ym lambda is not empty if and only if this Reinecke function is uh, less or equal to omega i for each v in s i check and uh, for each i in i. As I told you, I will explain you in a second what f i check is and I will explain you in a second what s i check is. These are certain combinatorial things on the outside and the right equivalent, but just to let you see now that there is some way to do it. Okay, so I will come to these functions. So the second one is, this M prime is you mod out VM and you add- uh, Also, what is omega i? Uh, sorry, omega i is a lambda of HI. So this is maybe what I did here at the beginning. It's uh, this omega i is this uh, lambda of HI. Thank you. Okay, so this is uh, the first part. The second part is you can get M prime just uh, doing quiver representations M mod v I, VM plus UM. And I'm again going to tell you in a second what is VM and what is UM. And the third thing is um, using the combinatorial description, one end can extend. So we were able to do it in type A the crystal structure to an affine crystal isomorphic to KI crystals, but only in type A uh, for multiples of fundamental weights. Otherwise, there is no affine crystal, which is isomorphic. But the, the kernel of Rechteke module is irreducible in that case. So uh, in that case, it's possible. But for example, in DN, we don't know yet uh, how to lift the structure. So everything depends on an orientation. So there is one very obvious uh, orientation you can take or the standard orientation you can take for type AM. And in this case, Alistair Savage, he has proved that the irreducible components, well, you can find an isomorphism, a crystal isomorphism from the set of irreducible components to the set of semi-standard Young tableau. So how does this uh, isomorphism work? <clears throat> Then, well, uh, say my standard Young tableau is a tableau with a certain filling of numbers. Okay, you fill certain numbers. And the number of S plus one in row R is given by the multiplicity. Well, so this, this is maybe not indecomposable. So you can ask, how often does this indecomposable appear in this module F? Okay. And alpha RS is the root alpha R plus alpha R plus one up to alpha S of SLM. So for the standard orientation, you can use this isomorphism and everything becomes uh, more or less obvious. But for the non-standard, for non-standard orientations, uh, there's at least, I don't know, any isomorphism to the same standard Young tableau, which is not. So I know there is an isomorphism, but because both of them are isomorphic to be lambda, but no uh, explicit one. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, there is one. You, yeah, sorry, yeah. Could you please repeat your last comment? Um, if About I take, uh, that you don't know that there is what an isomorphism is. Could you please? Yeah. I missed, yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this one is isomorphic to be lambda. And this one is isomorphic to be lambda. But of, so it, that automatically means there has to be an isomorphism. But uh, explicitly, it's not one. At least to me, it's not one. Only but, for this. But of course, if you know the crystal operators, then you can trace through them and trace back and- Exactly, but this is not- But you're saying that there's no direct construction without yeah. going yeah. to the highest weight. Uh, yeah, exactly. 
if you go to the highest weight, then of course there's always, you can do that, but uh, there is no going direct way. So given um, M, what is the corresponding tableau? So this is uh, not known. But this could also be said of different path models and so on. It's not an unusual situation. Exactly, exactly. Maybe in different path models. Yeah. So what's unusual is Savage's construction perhaps. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a bit lost. So you mm -hmm. said uh, Savage has constructed this isomorphism, right? So yeah. in which case do they, does it not known to exist or? No, no, it, it, it exists, but it's at least not, uh, well. Yeah, it is, I understand it exists abstractly, it must exist, but. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, you said something about you don't know something, that's the part I missed. Yeah, so what I don't know is when you choose another orientation of Q, so this, these irreducible components, they depend on, everything depends okay. on the orientation. Okay, okay. So if you choose a different orientation, then... Yeah, then I don't know the explicit uh, map to the set of semi semi young numbers. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah you're so for example, uh, okay, so what you can do is you can now take this isomorphism on the set of semi standard young tableaus. You can lift uh, the, uh, the crystal to an affine crystal uh, using this jeu de taquin. This is, was done by Shimozono. And by part three of our theorem, we can also lift this part, but um, uh, the, uh, the affine structure reduces. So our affine structure reduces to this jeu de taquin rule in this orientation. So if it, well, th there are more uh, combinatorial models known for, 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 for um, kirillov rich taking crystals, for example, there are these newly developed Fagin, Fourier, Littleman, and Wienberg polytopes, and there exists a crystal structure, and of course, one would like to know, at least I would like to know, if there isn't any orientation uh, related to these FFLV polytopes, where you can maybe just define directly a map to it. And uh, yeah, this is also something which I would like to uh, know. Okay, so now uh, I want to come back to the definition of the ingredients. So I want to define Fi check. So, Fi. So this, uh, when you say this FSLB polytopes, you're referring to your paper on the archive? Uh, yeah, yeah. This, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, now I want to, to, to define the, the ingredients of the theorem. Um, so F I check, uh, S I check, but for that I also need the non-check version. So uh, what is P I of Q? So now everything goes back to the Ausländer right equivalent. Okay, so now let's forget the geometry and let's try to understand the theorem, just combinatorial again. So what is P I of Q? So P I of Q is you take all indecomposable representations Remember that an indecomposable representation is just a vertex in the Ausländer Ryan quiver. So you take all vertices in the Ausländer Ryan quiver where there is a non zero map between M and SI, from M to SI. I will come to an example later. So, what is PI check? PI check is just you switch SI and M. So now you're looking for non zero homomorphisms from SI to M. Remember that SI was the uh, indecomposable corresponding to the simple root I phi. Okay. Good. So this is PI check. Now we need SI and SI check. So what is uh, SI? Um, I first need an order. So I say N is less or equal to M if there is a non-zero homomorphism. And SI of Q is just the collection of all direct sums where M1 to MK, they are an anti chain in PI of Q. So that means um, they are non comparable. Okay, so this is not a total order. So you can choose, for example, you can have M1 direct sum M2, and you have neither M1 is uh, less or equal to M2, or, nor M2 is less or equal to M1. So these are two non comparable uh, things direct sum of non-comparable elements with respect to this order. So an SI check is the same, just to take anti-chains in PI check. Let's do the example.
Let's go back to our Ausländer Writing Quiver. Um, now I uh, changed, uh, well, now I wrote the, the roots. Well, this is alpha one. This is alpha one plus alpha two plus alpha three. This is alpha three. This is alpha two plus alpha three. This is alpha two. And this is alpha one plus alpha two. So this is the Ausländer Writing Quiver. So now let's look at P1. Well, what do I want? Yeah, P1 check. So what is P1 check? So we look at all M such that there is a homomorphism from alpha one to M. So let's look alpha one. So this is my alpha one. So you can, so that's why I put one, one, one here. So you definitely have a homomorphism from one, zero, zero to one, one, one. This way. You have no homomorphism drawing from this direction. Okay, so you have, uh, okay, one, one, zero is here. You can choose this map combined with this map. And you have one, zero, zero uh, because you take, can take uh, the identity map. Now, you can say, okay, why is not zero, one, one in the set? Because you can go this way and you can go this way. But whenever you have uh, an Ausländer Reiten translation, this encodes a short exact sequence, this one. And short exact sequence means uh, the, the, the composition is zero. So going this way and going this way, it's zero. So whenever you have an Ausländer Reiten translation, so for example, what does it mean for here? It means that this map is the same as this map. Okay, so this is somehow uh, one has to know from the Ausländer Reiten theory. Okay, so if you do that, you will get these three uh, apps. So next I want to do P2. So what is P2? Um, P2 is now you take uh, all uh, indecomposable modules where, where there is a um, map from this indecomposable into alpha two. Okay, so, okay, now I have zero, one, zero because, uh, where is it? Uh, zero, zero. Okay, so you can take the identity, of course. Then you have zero, one, one because you have this map. Then you have this map. So you have a map from one, one, zero over there. And then you have uh, one, one, one um, going that way. Okay, so this is what P2 is. Um, now let's do S2 because we said we want to do anti chains. So S2 is you take all non comparable elements in P2. Of course, you can do every, you can take any element in P2. And if you do these two, Okay. So 110 is not less or equal to 011, and 011 is also not less or equal to 110. So that's why you can take this direct sum. Okay, so you can read everything off uh, in the Austin and Right group. Okay, so then I need uh, one more order. Then, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, could, could you yeah. please, sorry? Could you yeah. please explain why are the morphisms from one 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 two zero one zero. One 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 two zero one zero. It's uh, this combination, right? And it's not. But you said that it is an exact sequence. No, no, no. I'm just saying if it's an exact sequence at the border. So like this one. Uh, this one just means that there is a map. This way is the same as this one. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So th this is uh, so this does in, uh, means that this is the same as this, and here you have nothing above, so it's uh, what it's uh, yeah. Okay, so this uh, um, uh, another order. So v is less or equal to uh, v prime if and only if there is a homomorphism from b to v prime for every b. And b is just an indecomposable summand of v. And the other direction is uh, uh, v less or equal v check to v prime if and only if uh, there is a homomorphism from v to b, where b is now an indecomposable summand of v prime. Okay, so what is uh, these functions uh, of Reinecke? So you have uh, f i m comma v. You take the sum over all b in p i of q. 
and you take the multiplicity of B and M minus the multiplicity of the Ausländer Reiten translation of B and M. Okay, and if I check, well, you just put a check here and you put a check here and you have to go tau inverse here. So this is uh, what fi check is. Okay, so maybe we uh, do uh, one example. Let's go uh, and try to calculate, uh, yeah, I have the example here. So let's try to calculate f1 check uh, with 111. Okay, so uh, the definition is there. We have to look at p1 check. And since p1, uh, 111 is indecomposable, you have to look at every uh, b in p1 check where there is a map from b to 111. Okay, so let's go back to this Ausländer right curve. So you need a map to 111 in P1 check. Of course, you have a map from 111 to 111. Uh, you have a map from 100 to 111, but you don't have a map from 110 to 111. So you only take, uh, sorry, you only take these two. Okay, um, and the Ausländer right translation uh, of 111 is. 0, 1, 0, and of uh, 1, 0, 0, it's 0, 1, 1. Okay, so what you get is um, exactly this sum. So 1, 1, 1 together with the uh, tau inverse is 0, 1, 0, you have to subtract it, and 1, 0, 0 with the 0, 1, 1, and you want this to be less or equal to omega 1. And then you do this for the others as well. Okay. So uh, the um, other thing is I explain VM and uh, UM. So um, first look at this part over here. So you, you take FI of M comma V for all V in SI of Q. So, and you want to look at when this is maximal. So this can be maximal at many, many, uh, for many, many Vs. And then you take the maximal element among these with respect to this order. Again, you can have many, many, but this is a little lemma to show um, that there's a unique one. Okay, so there's a unique maximal element in SI of Q satisfying these two. So this is what you have to mod out, and then you have to add one representation, and the representation you're adding is described in this way. Well, you take uh, the direct sum of all elements in PI of Q, which are not small or equal to VM and minimal with this property. And if you do that, then you can translate the geometry, geometric part into the uh, quiver part and these functions by, by, by Heinrich. Okay, I think this is uh, all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, there's nothing coming. So, um, thank you. Let's see if there are questions from the audience. Sure, sure. You can just unmute your mic and ask straight away. Okay, so it, it doesn't look like there are any questions. Oh, actually, I have one. Ah, there is a question. Okay. Yeah, so this might be a little bit silly. So, because uh, um, so you mentioned earlier, there's a uh, quiver variety interpretation of the crystal basis. So, does that give you any like benefit from like the study of crystal basis once you have this uh, quiver variety um, interpretation? So uh, any input you mean? So using this geometric realization, any input to, to this B lambda to, uh, for understanding? Right, so thing? maybe I should ask, is this like, uh, if I am looking for an application, is this more useful on the crystal basis size or is this useful on the um, prevariant representation side? Quiver representation or quiver variety side? Maybe I should rephrase my question. So, um, is it? Can, should I understand it this way? Since we have a quiver representation uh, interpretation of the crystal basis, we can maybe yeah. use some tool from the quiver representation size to study crystal basis. 
Is that well, no, no, no. The quiver representation uh, interpretation of crystal bases was known before. Yes. So this is basically um, you have this is basically showing that these two uh, coincide more or less. Okay. okay. So basically, what uh, one does is the following. So you take these um, irreducible components over here. Okay. And yes. then you take uh, take your irreducible component, say y m lambda, and you map it to m. And, right. and then you have these geometric actions and these combinatorial actions. Yes. And basically what this main theorem tells us is an isomorphism. Right, so, so I mean, because uh, if in, in the computational point of view, the uh, combinatorial action is very explicit, while the yeah. geometric action is not so exactly. explicit. This, yeah. Exactly, this was the motivation, basically, yeah. I see, I see. Yeah. All right, thanks. You're welcome. But just to make clear, that on, so this geometric one is, was known, and this quiver part was known, but uh, if one has this isomorphism, you can calculate the geometric part. This is basically more or less the uh, motivation of why one was why one was interested to do this. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, but maybe I could ask you a sort of background question. So, in in this uh, seminar, we've been looking a lot at just uh, co crystals from a purely combinatorial view. And we are uh, well aware of their applications, uh, which are again sort of combinatorial in nature. Mm -hmm. So would you be able to uh, say a little bit about the motivations behind these geometric constructions? What, what was the problem that you know, people wanted to solve or why, why did they come up with these definitions? Uh, yeah, that's a <laughs> very good question. I should forward this to Saito, I think, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I no, know. maybe, you know, just, uh, I'm just I curious. I, I don't know if it's a good question. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the motivation was to do to, to this geometry thing, yeah. I mean, of course, in itself, it's very beautiful, so you don't need to ask this question. But I was just curious if there is some other, you know, how, how do you come up with this idea that this uh, translation idea? No, that uh, the, the crystal structure should be on the irreducible components of these varieties. I mean. You mean how Saito came up with the idea? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a good question, yeah, that I don't know. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I don't know why they constructed the geometric model, but of course it's a beautiful model to have this. Uh, yeah, but uh, I don't know what their motivation was to maybe just to find a geometric realization. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, just, just a very simple question. In the two varieties that you consider, don't yeah. you need a nil potency condition? Yeah, I need it only when I'm outside of ADE. This is uh, automatically satisfied. Oh, but, is it? I see. Yeah. So in the Lustig setting, you basically uh, impose nil potency condition here, but in type ADE, it's automatically satisfied. So where is, where is it? Yeah. This one. So this has so well outside finite ADE one has to put plus E put its condition you right. Okay, so any more questions? Okay, it, it seems like like well, there's a lot of new stuff in this for us. So wonderful talk. Thank you very much. And Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for attending. It was really a pleasure to talk. Thanks, James. <laughs>